So anti-fatigue lenses, what are they? Do you need the damn things? Are they any good? And how are they actually, what, where did they come from? Why, why did we decide this is the thing we needed? You guys have been asking, today we're gonna talk about it. I've put this one off longer than I wanted to, but someone finally asked the right way. Yeah, let's take a look at it and see what these things are about, what they can do for you, or if they're even a thing, that they're their own class. Hmm. Well, like it or not, this one required sitting down at the computer for, so I hope you are in for the ride and what we've got to talk about. So, anti-fatigue lenses. Essentially, what happened here is these lenses came about because we do so much right here. Here, where you're watching this where I'm recording this, right here in front of me on my phone, as the case may be. So we demand more of our eyes, we have more accommodation, and what it amounts to is we just need that little extra ad power sooner than what we used to need that little extra ad power. Most lenses, you know, we didn't prescribe anything under one and a quarter, one and a half. You occasionally see a one ad power, but it was pretty rare. Now we're seeing demands for a quarter ad power, a half an ad power, three quarters of an ad power. So what it amounts to is just something to relieve that little bit of a strain and depending on the lens design, make it easier to read out here. It may not even be something you need so much as just to increase comfort, which, as many of you who wear glasses know, the name of the game is making your world more comfortable and sharper and more in focus. It makes you able to perform jobs and everything else better because we like to be comfortable for whatever reason. And as we get older, our eyes just don't accommodate in the same way they used to. What it amounts to is it's always been that way, but now we notice it sooner. Mm. Great, right? So where before, around 40 to 46 is where most people would need progressive lenses. Now we're seeing, you know, 26, 28, 32. Basically, as soon as that eye stops progressing and starts regressing in the ad power it can supply, we're noticing it more. And you know, sometimes I see this prescribed for kids if they're doing a lot of tasks, more of a preventative means especially in higher myopia. But it's still about the comfort of it. It's not something you have to have. In fact, I don't wear them in these. I have a few pairs of them around. Most of my pairs are not anti-fatigue lenses. I did wear them for a long time, year, maybe two years. But I just, well, <laughs> the truth of the matter is I am a minus 175. There's my ad power. That's a bad thing. Yeah, because when I do need a progressive lens and I need that full 175 with the glasses off, I don't want to talk about that day. But what we're going to look at is what is an anti-fatigue lens even? I mean, it, they tell you it's an anti-fatigue lens. It's a single vision lens. No, it's not. But it's a single vision lens, and that's what they'll tell you. It, an anti-fatigue lens is a single vision lens that makes it easier to read. Well, guess what else is sort of a single vision lens that makes it easier to read? Got it? <laughs> yeah, it's progressive lenses. But to penetrate in a younger market, they did not want to use the term progressive lenses because that has what kind of connotations? You're, you're old and you need help reading because that's why you wear bifocals or progressives or whatever the case may be. Now, here's the thing I really don't like about this. It's not a single vision lens by any means. By the fact of it having more than one power in it, it is now a multifocal lens. I don't care what the hell they call it. It's not a single vision lens anymore. It seems simple. <laughs> but marketing had to get involved in this and they had to do their thing and now you have anti-fatigue lenses. 
that are single visions. Yeah, let that sink in for a minute. Now we're gonna actually take a look at why that really is the case. Now there are two exceptions I know of. One is a newer exception. I actually was looking up to give you guys a graph of and found it and I was happy about that. First one is gonna be the Hoya Sink. That one actually does come up from the bottom. You have a little boost in ad power at the bottom of the lens. It's made more like a digital bifocal, still not a single vision lens, than it is a progressive lens. And those I've worn, I really, really like that one. Out of all the anti-fatigue lenses, that one hands down is my personal favorite because it doesn't interfere with the distance, it doesn't interfere with the peripheral, but it does have that boost at the bottom of the lens to make the reading more comfortable and reduce that strain at a computer. And it is up a little bit higher, of course, as you would expect, because it's such a low ad power, they can bring it up higher without it interfering with your day-to-day. But everybody else doesn't do that. So the eyes in, they're not gonna share their graph with you because that makes it obvious that it's not a single vision lens and their marketing department is smarter than that. Or are they? Well, at, at any rate, I didn't look. So on their primary website, you cannot find their graph. The one you can find readily available or right on their website is the Zeiss Digital Smart Life Lens. Now this one I do like, it is one of the better designs. A lot of these companies are doing rebaked progressive lenses. They're using a cheaper, older design, kind of an antiquate, antiquated progressive lens, and they're using this to bring it back to life. And now this kind of brings up some of those points. The ad power is a little bit higher in the lens than a normal progressive lens would be. There were older progressive lens that specifically did that. What happens, and here you'll see it, this little section, and they even use the word, there it is, compressed corridor, progressive corridor, yeah. So, you know, it is it is what it is. They don't specifically say there's a single vision. Zeiss is a little bit smarter than that. I have to give them some credit there at least. They're not Essilor, okay? It's a good thing. But you can see those little pinch zones that we see on any progressive lens. You've got your distance zone at the top, eh, shortened corridor in this case to give that nice wide, fat near zone without much distortion. And since the ad power is so low, it does spread out pretty nicely over the lens. So it feels like it's just a small bump at the bottom of the lens for the most part. I would argue this is not true to form as these do distort higher up in the lens. And as you increase that ad power, that becomes more and more noticeable. And I don't think the camera will pick this up yeah, it's not going to, but this is that type of digital lens where it's a progressive. And you can see a little bit it's distorting as we go through it. More you can see the bubbling down here than you can the peripheral blur out here. If you focus very closely on the font, you can see it, but I doubt you're going to notice that. The camera just adapts too darn quickly to really show that off well. Okay, I spoke too soon, so here we go. This, you can see the camera starts to struggle, even on its own, as we get to the edges, it goes, what the hell is going on? And you can see, definitely, if we get enough distance, you can see that increase and that kind of bubble from the corridor. You can see it gets really wonky off to the sides and the camera realizes something is weird and it can't even focus through it. Now, obviously you're looking at that through the front of the lens, you're gonna say, Matt, that's not right. You can't be the glasses guy and tell us that's how it works through the back of the lens too, because the curves are different from the front and the back. Well, you would be normally correct, but you're not, so sorry. It's, uh, yeah a little harder to move this and keep it, but you can see it does the exact same thing. We get that very distinct fuzzing as you get away from the center. Now that one is the 0.75 ad power, which it's cool. You can do the progressive, you can do it up to about a half diopter, and then it works really, really good, kind of the same way. You're not gonna notice as much as that peripheral distortion. You're not gonna have as much other things going on in the lenses. It's still there. You're just not noticing it as much. 
So once you cross that 75, it makes a difference. And we see the same thing in older people with progressive lenses as well. You see that not 75, but when we jump to two is the big marker. When we go from 175 to two is the other one where progressive corridors change pretty dramatically. I'd say we see it a little bit at one and a quarter, but it's not as noticeable for most people. We've seen that adaptation from one to one and a quarter pretty well. I would never do one of these anti-fatigues at one and a quarter. Personal opinion, they sell them at it. You can buy them all day long. I wouldn't wear it and I don't recommend it. So there you go. So I mentioned there were two, not just the Hoya Sync, this guy here, the IoT Endless. You may have seen me mention this in another video. This is a new type of algorithm for creating prescriptions on a lens surface. It's really incredible, competes directly door to door with Rodenstock, which, you know, Rodenstock's been doing it for a long time. So, mm, gotta give them some credit there. Anyhow, this is not what we're talking about this guy is and this is what i found and wanted to discuss the iot endless plus this is the one that is their anti-fatigue lens still uses the digital ray path to tech now i have not worn this one yet but looking through the information and kind of the techie specs on it don't you love we're doing this live with you except not actually live here you go. So the power map is kind of what tells us how this lens works. And this is what we talked about before. You can see that distinct corridor design typical of a progressive or other lenses. This is normal other digital anti-fatigue lenses. This is what Zeiss uses. This is what Essilor uses. This is not what Hoya uses, but I don't have their power graph. We do have the Zeiss one and this one. And this is to show you kind of how it works. You'll see all of the power in the lens is what it is, except right down here, right in that little blip, right where you need it. And, you know, they have some blurbs over here. It improves reading speed, blah, 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 blah. And to an extent, I would have to say I agree with that. My short time with anti-fatigue lenses, it was easier to go to reading, go to distance, and just switch back and forth. It made that adaptation much easier. Now, did it actually make me a more proficient and quicker reader? Quicker reader, quicker reader. Good Lord. Eh, but we can blame that on the ADD. <laughs> All over the map, okay. <laughs> So what's cool with that is this is actually a merger of two technologies. Now, the IoT one I just showed you, it is a half diopter, three quarters diopter, and one diopter. It's a freeform lens, so we can tweak that a little. But you can order the exact same thing in a digital freeform round segment. The advantage here, if you know what you're doing, <laughs> I do, then you can just raise this just ever so slightly. And look, now you've got this huge field at the bottom. It can be made 28 or 40 millimeters wide, which is a big chunk of the lens for that near zone. You can order it in pretty well any power from memory. I think we go down as low as a half diopter. There we go. Click the right button, Matt bifocal invisible it's in spanish for some reason there you see our nice little round segment on the blank lens more spanish stuff digital ray path blah 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 it does not tell us ad powers it's available in on this particular leaflet so we're gonna have to go from my memory pity for you which i believe was a half diopter of power but what that does it gives you that little bit larger zone now that is based on the older digital ray path technology, which is not a bad thing. It is incredible lens tech, but it is not the Rodenstock rival that the new digital ray path 2 in the Endless and Endless Plus is. That is a lens. Oh, I love that lens. I love my Rodenstock lenses and my Endless Plus. Endless, I don't have the Plus. That's new. Oh boy. 14 minutes. I probably better wrap this up. So. If you have more questions about anti-fatigue lenses, what that specifically entails, we can talk about that another time. Blue blocking, 
whole other topic. We've discussed that before. Maybe we'll do it again soon. Who knows? But now at least you know a little bit more about what the marketing dilemma of these anti-fatigue single vision, no, lenses is. Have fun with that. Let me know your thoughts and feedback on this video. We're doing it on a new phone, so it's a little bit different, a little bit wonky. If you're new here, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, and stay up to date on the latest and newest. We're gonna get back in the routine of doing this. <laughs> I hope, hope. See you guys next time.